Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly Kane, and I'm the Marketing Manager for ENM. Thank you for attending our webinar today on how Slack National Accelerator Laboratory in Menlo Park, California, used safety PLCs to build their personnel protection system. After the webinar this morning, we will be doing a short Q&A. Please type any questions or comments into the Q&A box, the chat box, or email us at enmwebinar at enm.com. Now I'd like to introduce your presenters for today's webinar. Your first presenter is ENM's Siemens Product Manager, Bill Hintz. Bill has been working with Siemens, product automation, or with Siemens Automation Products for over 25 years. And your second presenter will be Enzo Carone. Enzo is the Director of Instrumentation and Controls at Slack. So let me go ahead and turn it over to Bill. Good morning, Bill. Are you there, Bill? I might be on mute. Good morning. Thank you, Kelly. There you are, Bill. Sure. Yes. Uh, before we get into Enzo's presentation, I wanted to talk a little bit about Siemens uh, safety. Uh, why do we do safety? Um, how do we do it? And um, some of the things that ENM offers for uh, people that are looking at uh, safety integration into machinery and process control. So. Why do we do safety? I mean, obviously there is a legal requirement these days to, to maintain a safe environment for personnel in the, env in the environment itself. Um, but then even more than that, protection and safety makes economic sense. Downtime is really expensive uh, for both machine and process control. And even more than that, um, accidents are far more expensive. So when we talk about why do we do safety technology, it, 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 other than the moral reasoning, um, there's an economic one as well. So let's talk a little bit about that. There are some documents out there that will uh, kind of quantify that. So um, every year, more than 2 million people are hurt worldwide as a result of work-related injuries. And there's uh, over 300,000 fatal industrial accidents. And each one of the irreversible injuries are, are in the six figures of expense. So in addition to the downtime and so forth um, the, and the, uh, the, the human cost, um, there is a large financial cost for downtime. And uh, essentially, uh, when we can minimize that or prevent accidents from happening, there is a good reason to actually uh, look into this. So let's look at a little bit about um, who's responsible for safety. And, and effectively, uh, safety is a kind of a broad-based uh, requirement for every aspect of an industrial environment. So the manufacturer of the machinery that originally made it, uh, the machine, the, the designs that they put into it, production, also Installation and commissioning. I mean, you can have the safest machine in the world if you run a uh, extension cord over a walkway to uh, power it up. That's not a safe machine. So, in addition, we've actually got an operator that's out there running the machine. He needs to be running it in a safe manner. There's a lot of safety systems that are integrated into machinery today, but they, you know, with uh, operators can be very clever on how they might override safety systems. And we need to be cognizant of that. And then once again, the new um, man, manufacturer, not the original one, but if we do um, modifications to an existing machine, then um, the new manufacturer actually has the responsibility to kind of start the process again and get everything back up to a safe state. So let's talk a little bit about a, an example of a machine. So here we've got a, some kind of a cutoff saw here where we have material coming in and we're actually uh, cutting it into smaller pieces. So in order to uh, identify where the problems arise here, we have to kind of investigate where the machine's uh, problem points are. So obviously the cutting disc where the, uh, the saw is happening is gonna be a potential hazard. Um, also, we can see flying chips coming off and in the, the uh, clamps that hold the machines or the uh, product in place while the cutting's happening could do a crush or a, or a pinch. Transport rollers could do the same thing. So all these different uh, aspects of a single machine need to be taken into account when we're actually looking at um, doing what we call a risk assessment. So let's talk about what we do there. A risk assessment is essentially um, taking a look at these different areas on the machine. And then in order to uh, accommodate a, a full risk assessment, we're gonna actually do a description of the machine. How does it work? What is it supposed to do? What is the process? And when we're doing that, we can identify where the hazard points are evaluate the risks of those individual hazards, 
And then we go into the next phase, and the next phase is risk reduction. And risk reduction, we actually define and evaluate safety measures. It could be nothing more than a warning sign or a guard on, a, uh, on, the, on the saw blade or those types of things. And then we, then we design the architecture of the safety functions that are going to accommodate that. Then we look into implementing that and put it into operation. And at that point, we're still not done because the, everything that we do in a safety situation, we want to have a proof of it. And so documentation is a big deal. So we document the measures that we took to mitigate some of the hazards. We carry out a validation. This is oftentimes done by a third party. So they will actually verify that what we uh, intended to do is actually uh, doing what it's supposed to for uh, maintaining safety, and then document all their results. So this is a process for every machine that we go through and uh, come up in the end with hopefully a safer, safer application of, um, for whatever applications we're doing. And there are a couple of tools that we use to actually achieve that. So the risk assessment itself is normally going to have us comply with a couple of different levels. And the safety integrity level or SIL level is kind of an international standard. Performance level is also uh, called PL levels, uh, kind of a newer one. So when we're actually looking at a machine hazard itself, really there's a chart here, and a lot of people that have done safety in the past have seen this chart, and it's actually kind of migrated over the years, and we end up with a, this last row over here is coming up with a performance level. They're rated from A, B, C, D, or E. So when we're going to evaluate a single um, hazard, potential hazard point, first thing we look at is what would be the severity of an injury if it were to occur. Uh, occur. So you know it may be a slight uh, reversible injury or a severe one. And once we've determined that, we go to this next blue step, and then we look to see how often does the um, exposure to the, ha the hazard happen. So if, if it's rare, then we would actually look at an F1 level. If it's frequent or continuous or, or we have long exposure to the hazard, then we would look at an F2 level. And lastly, we take a look and see, is it possible to avoid the injury when, when an event happens? So sometimes it's possible, other times it's hardly possible. So let's talk about what would happen here if, um, for an example. So if we were to say that the um, operator is exposed to a risk that could lose a limb or life, then we would actually be going right away to this S2 level. And if he was exposed to it very often, then that would go to F2. And if it is, if he had little or no chance to avoid that uh, instance, then we go to a P2, and that brings us down to this performance level E. So that that's really kind of the flow that we would take for each individual risk. Um, I mentioned that SIL levels and and the performance levels are uh, are similar. Um, this kind of shows where they fall in relation to each other. So a SIL3 and a PLE are equivalent. Um, we see a PLA, which may just be a warning sign type of an application. And then we see the other SIL levels comply with um, some of the different performance levels as well. So once we've actually done our risk assessment, and a risk assessment is really going to, once we get that performance level, we actually know what kind of hardware we would need to be able to accommodate a uh, risk reduction. So oftentimes at the very higher levels, we talk about higher redundancy. So an, an emergency stops, which may need dual contacts, and we may put two contactors after the uh, PLC system in series so that if either one of them um, locked closed, then the other one could still shut down the motor, that kind of thing. So once we've determined from our risk assessment what our performance level needs to be, then we can actually look at the um, actual components we would use to mitigate the problems. So first thing we do is we look at detection, and these are the sensors, the machine sensory systems, including EMO switches and, and red push buttons like that where we're going to actually tell the machine to stop. Um, we may have signaling columns. This is where we would find light curtains and, and scanners and those types of things that tell the machine when hazards are imminent. The um, evaluation step of this uh, process is actually where we find safety relays and safety PLCs and so forth. And we're going to talk a little bit about safety PLCs mostly today. 
And then lastly, when, when the evaluation has finished and we're actually turning on an output, for example, um, how do we react to that? So in other words, the contactors I mentioned, we may want two in series for a very high level safety system. Uh, Siemens manufactures VFDs, variable frequency drives that have integrated safety in them. So they can actually, uh, they can actually be used for shutting down the power that's going out to a motor and uh, in a safe manner and actually comply with some of the higher level safeties. Let's look a little bit more into the different options we would have for the evaluation part. So um, typical safety relays we would see on a machine that just has maybe an EMO or an e-stop switch and we're just gonna shut down power to the machine. So a single circuit might be uh, handled by a simple logic uh, safety relay. When we get slightly more complex, we can actually use programmable safety relays, and these are normally gonna be on a local machine that are just gonna have maybe five or six uh, safety circuits into it. And then we get up to the safety PLC systems, and th these are where we get more complex logic. We get distributed um, IO systems, so this can happen over a large physical area or a large machine where we don't bring all the wiring back to one box. We actually put uh, distributed safety IO nodes around the machine. So what Siemens offers with the safety PLCs is um, uh, the S7 series of, of processors are actually going to be available in, in both safety and standard PLCs for um, all of the different lines. So they, they, they have the 1200 series here. And anytime you see the yellow labels on these, you're gonna find that those are gonna be the safety variants of the same PLCs. And Siemens allows us to do standard and safety in the same, um, programmable controller, which is a big benefit because if you think about it, a lot of times what we would see in the past is we would have a PLC running a machine and then we would have some kind of a safety relay or system downstream of that just making sure the PLC didn't do anything bad. Um, essentially what we can do with these are, are safety certified PLCs so that we can combine those uh, capabilities and actually uh, have it into a single unit. So, and this is a uh, snapshot of what the software looks like. This is TIA portal. And the advantage to this is that if you see those yellow blocks in there, once again, yellow meaning safety, these, these come out of a library in TIA portal. And if you use those and you print out your documentation from that, that can go direct to a safety inspector and he will recognize these as, a, uh, as safety certified already. So it, it goes a long way towards uh, actually getting to standard compliant program documentation. So Siemens offers a wide variety of, of different safety systems. And if we look here, we've actually got a uh, safety controller we're going out over Profinet, the Ethernet uh, field bus, and here we have some I.O. devices out there. We can do safety on wireless. It's kind of an interesting concept. And then once we've uh, done wireless, we can also bring it over into Profibus. So some uh, existing systems with Profibus on them, we can actually accommodate those in safety as well. So with the Siemens safety PLCs, I mean, one standard controller can also be available as fail safe, as I mentioned. The, um, there is an additional password in the uh, F series um, safety PLCs so that if someone's modifying the standard PLC code, that's fine. If, if they go in and try to change the safety part, it, it requires a higher level of access. So you can actually treat the PLC as a standard PLC unless you want to change the fail safe stuff, in which case you actually have to take it to another level. So. Um, one of the interesting things about automation in general and safety in particular is that really nobody wants to be the first one to jump in. Um, you, you actually want to be able to see that other people have done this type of a thing before and certainly with Siemens safety PLCs, they were out before the uh, safety PLCs were allowed in North America. I mean, before the, uh, I think it was late 90s, they, they okayed uh, programmable safety systems. Siemens had been manufacturing them for years, over decades in Europe and so forth. So it wasn't like they then had to come out with a safety PLC. They already had these um, and they've been using them for years. So 
Where did they use them? I mean, here are, here are some references from North America. I mean, essentially we can see an automotive. Um, safety PLCs are used extensively in automotive at this point. Uh, material handling, same thing. We actually see um, material handling applications. Uh, safety is a big deal there as well. I mean, we all, anytime you see motion and people walking around, you actually need to make sure that uh, the environment is safe for everyone. So uh, safety PLCs in material handling is a big deal. Um, Statue of Liberty, actually they use the uh, Siemens safety systems on the Statue of Liberty's uh, fire and safety technology. Uh, implementation when they do the recent retrofit there. Uh, next we had aerospace. So the uh, the new Dreamliner from Boeing is actually a manufactured using um, safety PLCs. Uh, Disney, you guys familiar with the um, Pixar's Cars movie? They actually created rides for uh, that emulate those uh, that movie, and actually all the safety for those uh, cars and so forth is done with even safe, safety systems. And the last one I've got here is non-industrial stuff. So I mean, the Smithsonian Museum actually used uh, wireless safety to uh, do gate control and so forth for their uh, for their zoological park. So having said all that, um, essentially that is the. Uh, <coughs> extent of what I'd like to talk about today, and before I pass on to one of the, the projects that I look back on my career as the favorite ones I've ever done, we'll pass this on to Enzo. Great, thank yes. you, Bill. Enzo, I'm passing the presenter all over to you. Looks like we can see your screen. Yes. Okay, so good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you, Bill, and thank you, Kelly, for your introduction. Okay. Um, Audio is okay? Yes, audio is good. Great. Bill, can okay. you see Enzo's screen? I cannot. Enzo, so. go ahead and try sharing it again. I saw it for a second, I think. I had it ready, the presentation already going on, so I don't know what's going on. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to take it back and give it back to you again. Would that help? Uh, let me, I let me, for a second. Let me share it oh, again. Oh, here we yeah. go. Yeah. Okay. So now we so see now, your desktop. Okay, great. Now let's see if you can see everything. And let me swap. Perfect. There we go. All right. Great. Thank you. So welcome right, again. Thanks, Thank you very much. Um, so yes, this, uh, uh, this talk is about how we implemented uh, safety systems at the, the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory where I, uh, where I am. Uh, the laboratory was formerly known as the Stanford Inner Accelerator Center um, because it's operated by Stanford University uh, for the Department of Energy. It's located in Mellow Park, California. Counts on uh, roughly 1,700 employees, and uh, it's um, busy in research fields such as photon science, particle physics, and astrophysics. And it's now home to the world's, uh, the world's most powerful X-ray laser, the LCLS, Lina Coherent Light Source. So just to give you an idea of what, what we're talking about, um, uh, all the main activities uh, or most of the main activities, I should say, revolve around a particle accelerator, which is this uh, two miles long structure depicted here with the Highway 280 uh, uh, crossing over for a, for a little portion. Um, particle accelerators are not yet widespread household items, I should say. Uh, not yet, we're working at, at miniaturized versions, so um, I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes and describing what these kind of machines do, what, what these instruments look like. Um, as you see, this is huge. Uh, a very popular one would be the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, 
uh, in Europe at CERN Geneva, Switzerland, which is a big dough underground, uh, 26 kilometers long. So this, these machines are really huge. And uh, the reason why they're huge is because they are meant to look into uh, matter at a very, very small scale. And so the smaller the scale uh, you want to look at, unfortunately, the bigger the machine gets to be because the higher the energies you need to generate. And so what we do essentially is we uh, create electrons at some point in, in an injector at, at one end of the machine. And we accelerate these electrons uh, all over the, the two miles and then we we basically shoot them, we, we can do several things with them, right? Either we shoot them on a target, so we smash the target, which might be, say, a, a very thin foil of metal like gold, and see what's inside, you know, just breaking stuff, uh, really. Or we can uh, send them into uh, circular trajectories and accumulate them, and then we smash them again into targets. That's been the core business of this laboratory for the past uh, 50 years, uh, I should say 40 years of its life. The laboratory is 50 years old. And so all these structures were built in the 60s. And uh, surprisingly enough, some of them are still up and running. They, they were built uh, really nicely. Uh, but at some point, uh, 17 years ago, the, the laboratory went through a business differentiation. And so uh, the, the business model changed. And uh, uh, we thought that in addition to accelerating particles to uh, electrons and anti-electrons to smash them onto targets, we could actually use them to do uh, even fancier science, uh, like imaging, um, really looking into things at, at a very high resolution, very high detail. And that's what generated uh, the, the birth of, of the LCLS. So when I was uh, talking about the, the accelerator, so the, the, what you see here uh, in this aerial view is the, is the gallery. It's, it's basically all the devices and racks and controls uh, and uh, radio frequency generation uh, devices which are at ground level. The real accelerator structure is, is uh, 30 feet underground. And uh, um, part of it is, is still at ground level, and this is, this is what it looks like. So when you, when you talk about particle accelerator, this is the size of, of things as they are. And, and uh, in this very case, you have particle, you have electrons flowing uh, all throughout this gallery, and this is when the X-ray laser gets generated. And this is what you would see underground. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a prototype of the future accelerator we are, we are building. It's an upgrade. But this gives you a little bit uh, an idea of, of the scale with respect to, to human beings. And this, you know, these are the pipes where the electrons flow. And the rest, in, in this case, is uh, uh, for cryocoolers, because this new machine will be uh, cryogenic. Uh, we're talking about controls. So this is what the accelerator control room looks like today. Um, SLAC is a multi-program laboratory, that means that um, we have the X-ray laser, but we keep also accelerating electrons for various purposes, and so there are uh, different stations operating different machines, but this is what the operators look at throughout all the day when they generate the laser and tune it and deliver it to, to the experiments and to the users. So what we do, the mission is science. Uh, that's, that's what we do, and uh, that, uh, with the goal of exploring the ultimate structure and dynamics of matter and the properties of energy, space, and time at the smallest and largest scales in the fastest processes and the highest energies. Easier said than done. Uh, what you see here is the, uh, uh, is the photograph uh, of a virus which had never been imaged before because the tools just weren't available. Uh, all, you know, the... Um, electron scanning microscopes and everything that, that existed before didn't allow us for the resolution needed for a certain kind of, uh, of imaging. And so that's, that's, uh, these are the additional capabilities that this machine is providing to the scientific community. Um, through work at Dan, uh, uh, there have been six Nobel Prizes awarded and we publish uh, almost 1,000 papers every year based on the research uh, carried out at the laboratory. And so this is where the machine, this is where this instrument works in the, oops. Uh, 
Okay. So we look into the extremely fast processes and extremely uh, small distances. So we, we can look at, at the molecules and we basically have pulses which sort of travel uh, almost as fast as just quite close to the speed of light. So uh, what are the, specially, the special concerns in terms of safety for accelerators, right? So these are big machines and, uh, and uh, uh, they have some, some unique hazards. Uh, some of them are related to the fact that we generate uh, an electron beam and so there is a prompt ionizing radiation uh, due to field emissions, dark current, and so on and so forth, just specific to the fact that there are uh, particles traveling to a speed which is close to the speed of light. Uh, then we have laser systems. We have high voltage systems from the kilovolts to the megavolts because we have to uh, accelerate these particles all throughout the two miles of the accelerator. And uh, we also have electromagnetic radiation. We have cryogenic vessels. Um, we have areas where we have high voltage, high currents, and uh, we have explosive gases. We have oxygen deficiency. We have vacuum and pressure systems. So there's enough to give uh, quite a good dose of headaches to those who, uh, who have to design, operate, and maintain safety systems. And what I'd like to show today is how we uh, transition from an existing safety system which was uh, obsolete and dated and in, in need of an upgrade to something completely new. Uh, in terms of safety systems, so uh, the additional challenge of the accelerator is that they are machines which require simultaneous operating modes. You want to have access in one area while there's a beam in another area and then beam delivered into an experimental area. So <clears throat> we have to to have, uh, we usually have state machines such that we can handle these states in the, in the appropriate way. The main goal of safety systems uh, is, uh, as Bill was mentioning before in his presentation, is protecting um, human life and, and protecting personnel. The way we handle it is uh, through two separate systems. One is called beam containment and one is called personnel protection. And uh, one could look at them as something that prevents the beam from going outside of its enclosure. So you don't want, if, if something happens, you don't want the beam to go astray and uh, hit the walls or go throughout the walls and hit a passerby or something like that. And uh, on the other hand, you want to protect uh, people from getting into the beam enclosure. So you have to have um, access control such that nobody can inadvertently open the door and get inside the beam, inside the beam tunnel. What happens if somebody uh, gets trapped into the beam line? Uh, of course, we have emergency of buttons throughout the, gallery, throughout the tunnel. Um, uh, clearly, you get a, a dose of radiation, much higher than you would get uh, on your dentist chair. Uh, and, and that's definitely something that, that we want to avoid. So uh, the, the safety systems are an additional engineering control to the shielding. The reason why the beam line is uh, 30 feet underground is because uh, the soil itself provides enough shielding such that there's no beam that can be deposited outside. Uh, but our approach to safety is what you would call belt and suspenders. Uh, um, Bill mentioned you know, the life cycle assessment, reduction, and proof. And we do go through all this because uh, we can't afford to have uh, radiation incidents. Uh, the SLAC laboratory, we don't work on weapons. We don't have um, nuclear power generation plants. Uh, the moment the beam is shut down, it's shut down, and uh, the hazards related to radiation just disappear by virtue of the beam being off. So there are no criticalities or reactions that are self-sustained. But yet, um, we have to manage things such that uh, the risk reduction factor of somebody being in the beam enclosure when the beam is active or the beam going astray and hitting something uh, are managed. So that's one way to uh, look at what, at, what, at what I was just mentioning with radiation safety systems. On one hand, you have the uh, access control, and on the other hand, there is a sort of radiation control which goes with shielding and beam containment. Um, 
safety functions. So on one hand, the personnel protection system, the access control has to allow personnel to enter the accelerator housing. We still have to perform maintenance. We still have to access the tunnel um, in certain cases when the beam is off. And clearly we don't want to run the risk of some somebody being uh, inside the beam tunnel, inside the beam enclosure, and an operator inadvertently um, making one of the various hazards active. And at the same time, we had to provide safe containment of the beam should the BCS fail. So you see already within the two safety systems, we have implemented some redundancy. One, one safety system is, is sort of adding an additional layer of protection to uh, the beam containment system. Um, how this is done? Uh, well, two, two main sensors along with uh, all the other inputs uh, help the PPS uh, perform its function. One is radiation sensors. So uh, these, are, these are sensors which actually detect the radiation uh, in case the beam goes astray. And going astray means uh, milli radiance, you say, uh, a, a teeny tiny portion outside um, of the enclosure. And uh, uh, burn through monitors. So um, the burn through monitors essentially help in case uh, the BCS fails and in case the beam cannot be stopped. If there is radiation, these are uh, big aluminum foils surrounding, uh, big enclosures surrounding the beam and they get pierced and they would, they would shoot the beam off. And then the BCS, is, as we were saying before, protects people outside the enclosure from beam losses. And uh, these beam losses, as was mentioned, they're not fatal we do have shielding, but they need to be reduced. Uh, there, we're not taking any chance there. So in terms of inputs, outputs, these systems usually, so we're not talking about uh, gigantic numbers of process variables. Um, the, the LCLS itself, the control systems for LCLS, which, which we design and build, has to this day some one million process variables. But the safety systems, we're talking about maybe a few hundreds. So we try to keep it as simple as possible and, and of course, as reliable and available as possible. So when we talk about what kind of input outputs we have, we're talking about door and gate switches, switches for the key banks to get in and out, beam stoppers. Um, I didn't mention the beam stoppers before. These are huge slugs of copper which roll into the beam um, line and basically stop the beam if, if all else fails. Uh, there are emergency shutoff buttons and then there are also administrative tools. Uh, we talked about the sensors for the beam containment and then, so how do we shut off the beam, right? So the, uh, the, the most gentle way would be essentially shutting off uh, the gun, the, the beam source, the, the, the place where the electrons are originated. And if that fails, there is also another path, which is using the, the stoppers, as I was mentioning before. So we physically insert this, this uh, huge log of, of copper onto the beam. We also have deflecting magnets, so we can bend the beam and send it to a dump, another block of graphite, for instance. Um, and also we have accelerating structures which stop the transport of the beam. So these are uh, basically what represent the, the IOs for, for our PLCs or for the relay-based systems. And this is what uh, uh, an access point to the accelerator looks like. In this case, this is the access to the injector. So you see it, it's radiologically, radiologically controlled areas. So access is controlled. Uh, there are controls for uh, radiation, controls for uh, laser. And uh, this is the key bank that personnel uses to access the, the housing. And so whenever an operator or, or or an engineer or an employee has to access the beam enclosure, w one of these keys is taken uh, out of the enclosure and uh, the employee takes the key with her until she gets out of the beam. So it's, it's a sort of a token and uh, if the key bank is not complete, that means that not all tokens are there, the beam cannot be uh, turned on. And of course, all the doors are, are interlocked with the uh, redundant switches. So what do we expect of uh, 
controls for this kind of hazards? Um, well, they have to be fail safe, of course. So they have to fail in a way which is safe, uh, clearly. Um, we need to have protections and devices in, in the beam lines which are independent from each other. Um, current monitors versus uh, um, radiation monitors. All the racks are locked. The circuits have to be self-checking or redundant. Uh, usually we go to a, with a one out of two um, strategy. Uh, when a fault is detected, all the beams must be shut off by three independent methods. So we, we don't just shut off the gun. We do shut off the radio frequency. We shut off the laser. So we have three ways to make sure that the beam is actually uh, not operational anymore. The system has to be certified regularly, and I'll talk more uh, about that. Bill mentioned that everything has to be documented and validated, and that's a, a really large component of, uh, of engineering of safety systems here. And in fact, we have to uh, perform system and integrity checks uh, on a weekly basis for the beam containment or annually for the personal protection. And every time the accelerator facilities are in permitted access, that means that if we provide access to uh, the accelerator for maintenance or upgrades or anything for longer than 30 days, then we, we perform the entire certification of the entire system um, from scratch, from the very beginning. It's uh, the approach to safety systems uh, life cycle in, in the national laboratories is, is quite uh, strictly regimented and, and regulated. So, Everything we do in terms of uh, uh, design, be it a change of uh, uh, some software code or be it a change of um, some wiring or sensors or anything, anything that goes beyond the standard maintenance, uh, which means replacing a like-to-like -like component, has to go through a number of uh, reviews and approvals. Um, at the very least, we have a radiation safety committee, which is an independent body here at the laboratory looking at everything that's done for radiation safety. A radiation safety officer who, who is the entity which ultimately bears the responsibility of radiation safety at the laboratory. And also the accelerator department safety officer who is responsible for beam lines. The guidelines and uh, rules and standards that we follow are international safety standards, um, IC and NC. DOE orders, so DOE issues some orders which are specific to um, the facilities that the Department of Energy operates, and also internal guidelines for operations which detail how we are supposed to do things specifically to the facilities that we have here at SLAC. We follow a systems engineering life cycle, a, a very standard V model. Um, as, as Bill mentioned, it's a safety is responsibility of everybody. It's the contractor, is the manufacturer, is the designer. And so, with the uh, with the life cycle approach, what we do is essentially make sure that for every step on the left side, where we do design and coding and building and installing and commissioning and so on and so forth. On the right side of the V, there is a corresponding action which tests and proves and assesses what that's been done, what's been done. Uh, we keep software and hardware under configuration control. We have a dedicated quality assurance plan. Um, why we have a, a special QA plan? Because many times when, uh, when we uh, change the systems, we are not satisfied with just having reviews internal to the laboratory. And so depending on the severity, and, and on the impact of the change, uh, many times we ask our colleagues from other laboratories within the Department of Energy Complex to come over and look at our design and spend a few days with us uh, trying to see if there is something that we overlooked. Uh, there's no perfect design, right? And that's why we have tests. So we perform dedicated tests, initial acceptance tests and uh, standard acceptance tests, and they are reviewed by, by all the authorities having jurisdiction. And we have also dedicated training with a training registry. So it's not that anybody can go and program up a, a PLC for safety systems or modify the code. They have to be trained and we have to be able to um, demonstrate that uh, they have the appropriate level of training depending on the action they are expected to perform. Uh, this is uh, basically a model of the way we implement the, the redundancy within the PPS. And, uh, uh, it's a standard two chains, so there are there are uh, two uh, each interlocked uh, 
field or sensing device has two inputs, we call chain A and chain B, and each hazard receives two signals allowing operations, and we call them permit A and B. And the signals may or may not be crossed interlocked. So it's a standard uh, uh, redundant configuration. And uh, um, one thing I didn't mention for the software is that we also have two different programmers coding uh, the two chains. So uh, they, they will write the code in completely different ways, and we have them reviewed by different people, again, to assure to reduce the risk for, for systematic errors. Now, uh, a few years ago, we had uh, something that doesn't happen every day, uh, which is a possibility of uh, upgrading a safety system almost from scratch. The, the, big, the big linear accelerator, the two miles long structure, at some point, it was split into two sectors, into two major portions, west and east. And we knew that we would embark into an upgrade a few years uh, um, following. So we started to consider what kind of hardware should we select in order to comply with the new requirements. And uh, we needed to maximize the separation between the programs as much as possible. This shows the building as it was in the past. We had a PPS system uh, based on, on relays, actually on safety relays on uh, the first floor. And uh, uh, we moved essentially everything in the basement with, uh, uh, with sets of racks containing all the PLCs. And these are the backup power supplies. So as I was saying, we, we needed to have uh, different programs and uh, to be ready for what's happening today, where we are building yet another uh, accelerator still in the same tunnel. So there will be the so-called LCLS2, which is superconducting in the first third. There will be a facet, which is a still an electron accelerator in the second third, and the LCLS1 will still keep uh, doing science in the third sector, and they will all send beam to the experimental areas. So we had to uh, remove cables and uh, use the, some of the existing uh, cable plant to support the entire Linux uh, PPS. They need to remove the racks. They need to move the, the logic to safety PLCs. We, need, we wanted to provide touch screens to um, make operations uh, easier. And uh, along that line, we needed to increase the status and diagnostics for the operators. We had current loops, and we wanted to move away from current loops to safety networks and remote input output. We wanted to shorten the certification procedures it, 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 to certify systems based on relay uh, we were taking weeks that wasn't acceptable. And we also needed higher reliability and availability. And at the end of the day, we need to enable more science, which is our final product. The, the beam uptime is the value we deliver to our customers. We also had opportunities to provide for independent operation of multiple machine configuration and research, research programs. Everybody, every user wants a different beam with different properties in terms of energy, luminosity, and so on and so forth. Uh, we need to increase reliability because that system was 40 years old already. Uh, we needed to be able to support future requirements uh, like machine segmentation, renovation, and so on and so forth. And we also wanted to move the division, my organization, to a full or almost full ANSI IC compliant safety systems lifecycle process, which in itself has its own challenges because that's the place where uh, not only have you got to rely on the right hardware, but you have to implement the right management structures to make that happen. So we wanted to simplify everything. Uh, system relay base was too complicated. Maintainability was, was hard because components were obsolete and redundancy was not acceptable. So this is what we, what we had, a humongous mainframe spanning for, for several feet, connecting the racks and the trunk cables going to the accelerator enclosure. And uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, the, the, what we were presented when we started to look at this. Three racks, uh, 87 relays, uh, lots of documentation, and we needed to make some sense out of it. So uh, the model was not scalable. Uh, it was not deterministic because it was all relay based. And so we thought that the first approach would be uh, following IC 61508, and, and that was in itself, again, a new approach to safety systems management because we had to rethink about how we uh, manage the entire life cycle. Again, what, what Bill mentioned, assess, reduce, improve in a very formal way. And this is the safe machine for the system. I'm not going to comment on it, just let you know that it's not, again, it's not extremely complicated. You have, uh, you have essentially 
apart from uh, from the off state, you have you have five states across across which the system can move, and this is what it looks like today. And so you see, it's based on a, on a Siemens on a seven three hundred family and uh, the safety remote I/O uh, the two hundred series. So it's working now. It's operating as we are speaking in the accelerator. If you hear a little bit of humming uh, in the background, it's because the accelerator is up and running, and uh, the humming is caused by all the cooling pumps and the uh, devices on on the gallery. Uh, when we use the IC design process, we went through a number of, of uh, very well-defined steps to identify hazards, define the requirements, allocate the functions, provide training, and specify the system, and then the software, uh, document the assurance, and then build, install, and validate. We, did, we, we covered the entire life cycle in-house from conception to commissioning, testing, and deploying. And these are some of the safety functions that we implemented. Um, with the with the seal levels that that we recommended, so the highest would be of course prevent beam transport from exclusion to occupied areas. We don't want the beam uh, to reach areas where where which are occupied by people, and that's the the one requiring the highest seal. Otherwise, um, the shut up. Uh, the shut off of the interlock devices um, activated by an emergency stop in the tunnel, for instance, that goes with a C level two, uh, like mo most of them. And the challenge was, of course, trying to uh, find a good compromise between the complexity and cost and the number of safety functions we wanted to employ and what kind of hardware we could use. Uh, safety relays, programmable relays, safety PLC solutions, and so on and so forth. So we, we had this uh, great opportunity to start with a clean slate, evaluating all the possible manufacturers uh, independently. We had external uh, uh, help. Uh, we needed to include the hardware portion, the software portion, and the process portion, the way the entire life cycle was, was managed. So we looked really at, at everything, uh, again, doesn't happen every time in the life of an engineer to have a chance to uh, choose whatever whatever is the best solution for uh, for for the problem without too many constraints, I should say. Um, and we came up with with selecting the the, the Siemens family. Um, why Siemens? We had an initial design using the PILS Multi, which is a, a, a programmable safety relay, which served us very well, but we ran into I/O limitations. We used a, a kepner trego decision analysis methodology to rank options. So we had a big chart in terms of what we had to do, what would be nice to have, and what we could live without. Um, we, we searched for available options, and then we got to the third generation safety PLC. So uh, what we found with that was a broad product family, lots of products, uh, very integrated infrastructure, which is very helpful when you have to upgrade and constantly change uh, your, your system. Um, there was extensive experience with safety PLC applications already. We got very excellent training and support network. Siemens were used already at other accelerator facilities, both in the US and in Europe. And as, as Bill mentioned before, now uh, one can make safety and standard IO. And that was something that we were really interested in. Uh, so. The, yes, the, these are the pros and cons, we'll, we'll, we'll skip through that. And uh, um, there were some issues that we have with the new architecture because, of course, we had to take care of, of integration of all design with the new hardware. We had cybersecurity considerations, um, standard and safety IO networking, and then modularity, and so on and so forth. And uh, standard and safety IO can share a CPU and the network. That's, that's a big for us. And uh, um, this, this allows for a great simplification of, of the entire system, and we really like the way it, it's implemented in Siemens, in the Siemens PLCs, because we don't lose anything in terms of uh, security, cyber safety, and configuration control. But we gain having one engineering platform for both applications. We have the same protection of safety and non-safety program. I should say the safety programs have an additional layer of protection from unauthorized access. So. Uh, it works really well for us. And all the face safe communication was handled through ProfiSafe. Um, ProfiSafe is certified um, to comply with the IEC 61508 standard, which is what uh, we have used. And uh, it supports both ProfiBus and ProfiNet. And um, again, it, it, it gives lots of reports in terms of faults, falsifications of data, delay, data loss, and so on and so forth. 
and you have only one physical bus. Again, it, it makes life, especially when you are running your uh, IOs over a two miles long structure, uh, that makes quite a difference because you know you have to run hundreds and hundreds of feet of cables. And this is one example of what this architecture looks like with one CPU, in this case, uh, governing the Linux East logic, and then everything communicates through um, switches, and they're, they're again, uh, Siemens switches, with Profinet. And we can go to a local control room with remote IOs, and we can go to Linux sectors, in sector 21, sector 28, uh, main control room, remote IOs, which are both standard and safety IOs. So very neat, very elegant, easier to maintain, easier to scale up and to change as needed. Uh, I was mentioning cybersecurity, cyber safety considerations before. We also considered that when we were selecting the hardware uh, for, for this new project. And, and by the way, uh, this project was very successful and that paved the road basically for making Siemens a standard uh, PLC in use for our uh, safety systems. But um, our interpretation of the um, Cybersecurity, you know, starting with the uh, NIST 853 and and uh, you know the, the Obama presidential order and the various incarnations and various standards that that follow through. The challenge for uh, cybersecurity for control systems is that, of course, the approach is different than cybersecurity for uh, IT for standard IT. We care about uh, different controls and things which are important to us and not important to IT and vice versa. So this, these are some of the controls we looked at uh, for our cyber safety analysis, the physical isolation from controls network, uh, possible accidental download of safety critical program from controls network. Somebody in the control room just accidentally sends a different version of the software to a safety PLC. Possible intentional sabotage of safety critical programs. Uh, possible accidental download of access control program from controls network. So. We care also about the non-safety critical portion of the software, and we treat it with the same level of uh, um, security as we do for, for the safety critical in terms of cyber. Uh, sabotage of access control, accidental changes to the uh, EPIX EDM HMI. So the, the EPIX is the uh, experimental physics control system that we use um, to, to display all the controls, the thing that I showed in, in the control room. It's one of the many flavors of, of, of SCADA. And uh, uh, of course, uh, accidental or intentional changes uh, through the HMI from, from the controls network. And uh, we also yeah. looked very deeply into the software configuration management. So using a, a configuration versioning system to control the version control, managing checking in and checking out, tracking and checking the checksums, uh, software download is password protected, download over network, download to wrong CPU across Profinet network, and protection against the wrong safety program load. All these um, either are allowed because they are implemented uh, by default into the uh, architecture with Siemens, or um, uh, basically we, we, we made sure that we configure them such that they could satisfy our requirements. And this is one of the uh, human machine interfaces I was mentioning before through this APIS control system, just to show you what, what it looks like. It's a standard synoptic. So a few lessons learned from uh, uh, and strategic choices from, from this endeavor, which uh, I, I should thank Bill for, for saying that this has been one of, one of the projects that he remembers uh, with, with the greatest pleasure and more vividly, and it, it's the same for me. It was a, an amazing collaboration, and that my number one um, uh, point I would like to make is get the right partners. We were embarking into hardware we had never used. We were going under humongous scrutiny. There was no option to fail, really. Um, the new hardware, we weren't necessarily conversant with Siemens uh, hardware or with the TIA interface. Uh, it was, it was, everything was new. Um, and laboratories, uh, national laboratories are extremely conservative when it comes to safety. So, you know, we, we take our time and we make sure that, that we, we cross the proverbial T's and, and dot the I's um, so, so things are done uh, the way we like them to be done and the way DOE uh, expects us to do. So we partner with the Jefferson Laboratory. It's another DOE laboratory in Newport News, Virginia. Um, I'd like to, to mention Kelly Mahoney, Henry Robertson, and Tommy McLeod, these three safety systems engineers there who, who partner with us and work with us. And then Siemens and DME, 
they made the difference because they provided, they bridged the gap which we uh, had in order to move to a new uh, family of products and to a, newer, to a whole new architecture, right? I mean, you're moving from relay-based system to a PLC, distributed architecture, and so on and so forth. Uh, we got beautiful training to, to my engineers. Uh, we got assistance and training through worldwide renowned experts. Thomas, we came here and he spent hours and hours with us going through many, many details of the design. Uh, we got 24-7 assistance from, uh, from EM, ENM through Marv Gugamos and Bill Hintz. So uh, Bill himself spent so much time here helping us in designing, costing, commissioning, training. They made a huge difference. We, wouldn't, uh, we, we couldn't do it alone. We had on-site seminars and brown bags. We got hardware on loan for tests. So we could run tests on a test bench and convince our reviewers and uh, our safety officers that uh, the systems were as solid and robust as they expected them to be. Uh, we got help throughout all the phases of the projects. It's not that you, once we signed the contract, they disappeared. We, uh, we, we really went together all of it. And with the large network experts, when uh, when a module when a PLC module fails here at Slack, we don't just replace it. We call ENM or we call Siemens, and we want to understand what caused that failure. And and uh, and in one case, we got put in touch with headquarters in Germany, and uh, we got really really great satisfaction in terms of why that system was failing. That's the level of of oversight that we get for safety systems here, and. Uh, if we can't get this level of uh, information that uh, my life as a director and the life of my engineers would be, would be really miserable. Um, we need to be honest in assessing our strengths and weaknesses. The, this upgrade was a very challenging project and we needed help. So we needed really a partner who was willing to understand um, where we were deficient at that point. And then we need to provide a tangible return on investment for the stakeholders. So the touch panel for the engineering interface makes maintenance quite faster. Uh, when we're caught in the middle of the night, the engineers go, they have their own, uh, uh, their own HMI with their own uh, controls. Uh, better diagnostics make the system easier to operate for the control room, and so it's faster. We get better um, uh, beam availability. There is a great cost-benefit ratio because we are having a lot of features, and uh, it's very scalable. So we're building SCLS2 now, and it's all networked, so it's a matter of connecting everything together. We also know that we, we couldn't bite more than we could chew. So it's, we like integrating safety and non-safety functions in one CPU, but we didn't do it at the time. We did it later, it works beautiful, but at the time it would, be, would have been too aggressive. And then my personal perspective is leave people alone. <laughs> um, once the project started where there was a lot of involvement you know, from, from management at many levels, um, at some point when, when it was clear that we were good to go, the, the Slack JLab team was completely autonomous. They had full authority on their resources and on their schedules and budget and scope. And uh, this uh, also took advantage of a new generation of project managers and engineers at Slack. Uh, the two of them were the responsible ones for, for the project, Christina Turner and Matt Sitersky. And they were eager to implement a new system and they had a chance to start on something new and something huge. And this is, this is the real deal. So you see this is Marv and Bill is here and Matt and Christina uh, close to the rack with all, uh, they're covering the, the safety PLCs, but you see the, the touch panel interface I was mentioning before. And this is uh, Tommy, Henry and Kelly from JLab and Tom Eswick who's uh, still with Siemens, I think uh, in a different capacity though at this point. So these are the real heroes. Uh, what was missing there uh, was uh, Andrew Etherington, who is our um, new ENM account manager. And that's basically, that was family when, when we did this. It wouldn't have happened without having all these people working together day and night with the level of passion and commitment which was unbelievable. And, and those, are the, those are the people I would like to thank. Uh, I, I'm, I'm deeply and profoundly grateful uh, for, uh, for what they have achieved, for their commitment, uh, their skills and their dedication. That is really what made today's talk possible. Not to take anything away from uh, how good the Siemens products work, uh, but the synergy between the people and the products, um, in our case, really won over all the hurdles that we have to overcome administratively from an engineering standpoint and so on and so forth. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Enzo. That was very um, interesting. Um, let me go ahead and pass it over to Bill. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, Bill. Um, so I'm passing the presenter all back to you. 
Are you there, Bill? Yeah, I'm here. Just okay. uh, sharing my screen here. Okay. Okay. Um, Enzo, excellent. Thank you very much. Appreciate it and all the kind words. Um, I do have a couple of questions here. There are actually quite a few. Some of these I'm going to have to take offline and get into detail with um, with people. But um, there's a couple of repetitive ones here asking questions about um, emergency stop switches, what sill levels we need to be at, and what kind of um, switches would would be needed for safety. And, and basically the answer for that is if we get to sill level one, we're going to start talking about safety rated switches. And generally what that means is for an e-stop, that's what's called a positive opening switch. And essentially what that means is when you hit that red button, it actually rams something in between the contacts. So if those contacts are fused, it's going to ram them open. And, and it, this positive opening is, is a feature of um, safety related e-stop switches. Now, when we get to the higher sill levels, we start talking about redundancy, and we, we'd have multiple contacts in, the, in every uh, e-stop switch. And, and the Siemens I/O modules automatically will um, adapt to that. So, if we have two inputs coming in for a switch, it, from the programming perspective, it just looks like a single on or off. And the, and the I/O module itself handles all the uh, the, the verification that both contacts switch at the same time and that kind of good stuff. Um, next question is, can I use my S7300 with that? new software, and actually, yes, you can. Um, the TIA software will uh, work with the S7300 and 400 series as well as the, the newer 1200 and 1500 series. So um, that's something we can actually, um, you can start seeing some of the added features of the newer software and then some of the engineering efficiencies that we see by using TIA. Um, the rest of these questions are a little bit more in depth. It looks like we're kind of buttoned up against the time here. So once again, thank you, Enzo and Kelly, and um, have a great weekend, everyone. Yes, thank you very much. And just um, for those of you who are on the webinar still, this webinar was recorded. So if you want to um, share it with any colleagues, it will be on our website later this afternoon. Um, again, thank you, Bill, and thank you, Enzo. Um, thanks, everyone, for attending, and have a good weekend. You're most, you're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, and thank, thank you. you, Kelly. Have a good weekend, everybody. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.